I thought before I start talking in my um, presentation to at least give a little bit, even a little bit more of a background of um, the how I kind of came to my position, and then you know the kind of setup of the talk will be that I'll go through my talk and try to especially leave some time at the end to answer any questions, whether it's about education or work um, or um, other kind of things that could be about the topic itself. So I had done um, my undergraduate work in, at Harvard University and actually was in literature, and more specifically Latin American literature. Um, that allowed me to both continue with my Spanish and do things like study abroad, and also continue with my Armenian because I'm Armenian and have that all kind of count for credit. But at the same time, I was taking different psychology classes, working in a, as a research assistant, which is a big thing if you can get that good experience now as an undergrad. It really looks, and if you are thinking about pursuing um, psychology it can either be good for your resume or it can be helpful to kind of understand whether or not do I really want to do this um, so for me I had been doing that but the, we didn't have minors in undergrad until my senior year um, so it kind of just looked that I'd graduated with um, in literature and um, had these other classes, but when I was trying to apply for take some time off and apply, work in between undergrad and grad school it was kind of difficult to find a job in psychology because I think people are like, you, you know, you're applying online and they're like, what does this literature major want to do with psychology? Like, how does this make sense? And so it was an interesting kind of experience to have that difficulty, but then kind of just getting started um, at the University of Miami, their department of psychiatry, kind of as an admin assistant just doing different, you know, admin work, coordinating poster sessions or other kind of events or different things to help um, the department. And then finally being able to be a research coordinator on a project that then helped kind of um, give me enough background to be able to uh, apply to grad school. And that was after a few years. Um, and then kind of that's when I started at Loyola um, where I did my graduate school work in Chicago. Um, getting a lot of different experience with minority youth and uh, doing research, uh, dissertation, um, looking at uh, Latino American youth and exposure to violence and self-efficacy. Um, and after that, I had done my uh, internship, this is my last year of my program at Rush University Medical Center in Pediatric Psychology, and then did my fellowship at Children's Hospital of Orange County, also in like pediatric psychology with a kind of specialty in their um, oncology, um, patients and families. And so that's where uh, this case ends up coming from. And then now I'm working at Phoenix Children's Hospital. It just has been a little over two years um, in, with their pain management team. And so uh, mostly I work with chronic pain and it's both um, inpatient, so in the hospital, uh, kind of getting consulted for some acute pain. So that would be like an after a surgery or um, people have an accident or something like that and they need help kind of um, getting an evaluation and getting uh, a sense of uh, coping skills and assessment with it as well, um, brief treatments, and then also working on the outpatient side um, in different capacities as well. So we have a um, multidisciplinary um, intake clinic, so that involves both the medical physician, the physical therapist, and psychologist. Uh, and we kind of have those uh, clinics both at the main campus downtown. We uh, actually just recently opened up um, uh, intake uh, day over at the Mercy Gilbert uh, offices not too far away near the Dignity Hospital. Then we also have a clinic over in Avondale in our satellite clinic and also in Scottsdale. And so it's really kind of the only, if I'm not mistaken, uh, at this point, you know, over these past five years, I think, um, multidisciplinary pediatric pain kind of team or clinic in the state of Arizona. So we get a lot of people all throughout the state, but also sometimes from Utah, from New Mexico, sometimes Colorado, or even Mexico itself, or California, to kind of uh, have a catchment, a really pretty big catchment area. Um, so that's been pretty cool to see, and you get to see a whole wide spectrum of things. We kind of joke that um, if it hurts, we see it. Um, and so that's been a really cool thing that we do. I also have those kind of typical follow-ups for the pain patients that come for weekly or bi-weekly kind of appointments to my office, doing that more um, outpatient side. And also we run a teen pain group. Uh, my colleague and I, um, he kind of spearheads it, and that's a weekly group that we have on campus as well. 
And like Katie had mentioned, we're starting a new initiative to work with the PEC surgery team at Phoenix Children's and also to help with different chest wall anomalies. So one of them is pectus excavatum, which is like the kind of concave chest, but also other um, slipping rib and other kind of syndromes that affect the chest wall. And so um, kind of helping pre-op during, uh, you know, operation and then um, post-op recovery too, um, in all different kind of aspects of that pain management. Um, so cool. So just kind of wanted to kind of go over that and then we can kind of get into leaving some time for any questions about any of those pieces and about the case that'll be coming up. So it's going to be, as it's kind of saying, a chronic pain and a chronic illness. And so with our focus on this cancer patient, that'll be. Um, and this one is something that's more on a kind of inpatient uh, case basis. So it was like an initial consultation with a lot of follow-ups that would be handled mostly on the inpatient side. So no disclosures. So sad to say, but no, uh, just kidding. Um, nothing to disclose. And kind of the overview is that we'll try to get a definition of what pain is and then kind of go over the prevalence of it within the mostly the U.S. Thinking about... Um, reviewing the different kind of frameworks that come with pediatric pain, how do we assess it, how do we treat it, and also thinking about um, things about like cultural considerations and also resilience, because a lot of times it's easy to focus on pathology or you know symptoms and that kind of stuff, but how can we also be thinking about resilience and strengths for our patients to not only be focusing on that negative, and then I'll go over my um, case, and then at the end, definitely trying to leave some space for all types of questions. So thinking about the definition of pain, these are two common ones which I like. Um, so we have, uh, let's see here, Margaret McCaffrey, and so this just whatever the person is experiencing says it is, wherever it is, whenever it is, um, and really kind of underscores that personal subjectivity. And then a little more um, scientific with the American Pain Society, kind of underscoring the unpleasant sensory kind of experience. But also, they do a great job of including um, that it's going to be an emotional experience, as well as could be actual, or just even potential tissue damage, or how it's described in that terms. So it really is something that can be dynamic and personal, and um, we kind of have to really listen and hear what that patient is saying. Then we kind of want to think about definitions again. So this is not something that you have to focus too much on the cycle or anything, but you know, acute pain is going to be usually under three months long, um, kind of related to some kind of tissue damage, like stubbing your toe. Um, and then also, it's going to usually kind of wrap up or get end when there's the ending of the, any stretching, contraction, or impingement on the body. Uh, then if we instead think about chronic pain, just understanding it as a cycle or recurrent, because sometimes for certain chronic illnesses they flare up or they go down every once in a while, um, it's going to be something that we think about lasting longer than three months. Um, it doesn't have to have any tissue damage that's related along with it. Um, and usually it's going to be prolonged, lasting after any initial um, event or injury had occurred, and even after it healed. My um, talk is going to focus more on the chronic pain piece. So thinking about um, conditions related to chronic pain, um, what might people think that they've heard or kind of think or could be different medical conditions or other conditions that are related to chronic pain? Anything. What would you say? Fatigue. Fatigue. That's going to be a big kind of symptom that comes up with so many of them. So that's a good one. Chronic fatigue syndrome, though, kind of can overlap with a lot of them, too. Yeah. What else? Anything else people can notice or think of? Mm -hmm. Say it again. Low self-esteem. So that can be, that's definitely something that's going to be kind of comorbid with a lot of our chronic pain. But even like different kind of medical illnesses that you might think of or you may have heard about that is related to. Fibromyalgia, a classic one. And so that's a lot of times what we hear about when it comes, especially when it comes to adults and all the, you know, um, biologic, you know, commercials on TV and stuff like that. Um, a lot of times, you know, in our clinic, we like to think about it um, because it can be very stigmatizing to kind of think about it that way. We sometimes like to think about it as like um, amplified musculoskeletal pain. If we can actually, our physicians can actually kind of figure out the different skeletal or muscular, muscular um, kind of points that they're coming from to kind of hopefully... Um, 
continue to like giving hope because that's another big thing is like being realistically positive and hopeful is another big part of our treatment and just like kind of our approach in our clinic. Um, any other ones that people were um, thinking of? Arthritis. Arthritis, exactly. Whether it's juvenile arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, different things like that. Yeah. Cool. So um, here's just a few different kind of things. This is a button, by no means an exhaustive list. Um, we have other things that are clearly kind of medically indicated, like with sickle cell, and that's a really easy, good example of like a recurrent kind of uh, chronic pain. Um, cancer, as we'll see here, like the arthritis we just mentioned, pancreatitis or lupus. Um, then we kind of get as the spectrum, and apologies, there are some misspellings, but this was a PDF, so I wasn't able to fix it. Um, so we have different kind of headaches, because sometimes tension headaches or migraine headaches can be very much triggered by different um, explained or unexplained type things. Then there's um, costochondritis, which is more of, you know, rib pain and kind of chest pain uh, things. Ehlers-Danlos, a lot of hypermobility is what we see with a lot of patients. Um, and uh, some of these symptoms have a lot of things that overlap. And so far, again, in Western medicine, in our healthcare system, we don't have an exact uh, understanding because you can have, like, if we think about studying, even psychology, dimensional versus kind of like, you know, um, uh, kind of symptom criteria, like uh, dichotomous kind of things, yes or no, or like having symptoms that you're going to check. This is a very similar thing when it comes to chronic pain and the kind of um, overlapping symptoms that can present to different specialties. Um, and then more of the medically unexplained, whether it's fibromyalgia, the kind of recurrent or functional abdominal pain, um, Com we usually now call it complex regional pain syndrome, CRPS, or RSD, reflexive sympathetic dystrophy. So just some different examples. And then if we think about um, the prevalences, so this is just to kind of get a basic view about how um, headaches are, you know, surprise, surprise, pretty prevalent um, when it comes to pediatric and uh, chronic pain. Um, then you'll have abdominal pain, so stomach kind of issues, also very common back pain, lumbar pain, different extremities or limb pains, um, and then that kind of fatigue that we have mentioned here, and also juvenile fibromyalgia, um, or chronic fatigue syndrome too, some of those overlapping things. A caveat that we want to keep in mind is that, um, of course, different specialties are going to have different prevalences. So if I'm working in a neurology clinic, I'm going to see more of those migraine and headache patients. Or if I'm working in gastroenterology, I'm going to see a lot more of the abdominal pain patients. Or rheumatology, see more of the fibromyalgia type patients. So kind of keeping that in mind. Also keeping in mind that different research studies are going to have um, different kind of criteria. Some people are, might be more strict in their diagnostic criteria, really sticking to the DSM-5 or something like that. Others might be keeping it more open. Maybe it's like T-scores of 65 or above on certain screening tools or just self-reports. And so kind of keeping in mind as we read through where we're getting these numbers from, what, and that's a lot of times why we're going to have kind of some of these larger ranges. And then as we think about prevalence, we also want to think about comorbid conditions. So definitely, kind of one of the big things that we see is going to be anxiety. Um, and that's why all the way from 11% to 81%, um, you can see a lot of comorbidity when somebody has chronic pain. Um, again, it's a tricky thing, or even when it comes to depression, 13 to 26%, but I see a lot of my patients who are reporting a lot of depressed mood and other things, and it's how do we try to be mindful and tease apart what is kind of very soon related to the pain, what is more um, long-standing depression, what is um, what we would understand as maybe typical kind of teenage emotional changes and stuff. So a lot of things to consider, but definitely it's stuff that people are presenting when they come to see you um, in the clinic. On top of all of that, another big thing is how much this kind of ends up costing the healthcare system. Because while we, um, you know, have the kind of wherewithal, we have some of that knowledge and experience in our clinic, the interesting thing is that a lot of times to get to our clinic, our patients have to have like all these other diagnostic things completed before they can come to us to make sure everything has been checked. And so if you think about that and going to all these specialties, or if you, some people who are admitted to the hospital or go to the ED because they're unsure of how to handle this kind of really intense pains, that can be really, A, scary for our patients, B, also very expensive um, in time, 
um, emotional expense, but also in our healthcare system and insurance. And so how do we kind of um, help our patients so they don't keep on coming back to the hospital? How can we help them to be functioning and gain the tools that they need so they can handle, hopefully, more and more, be more self-efficacious outside of the hospital um, so they won't have to come back? Because thankfully for most of our chronic pain patients, it's nothing that's actively damaging their bodies, but it's just like not knowing, again, because it's a still a mystery and still not really fitting into the mold of our medical system, how do we help them to get those resources? So then kind of thinking about, um, moving on to thinking about different theories when it comes to pain. Um, one of the big ones is this gate control or gate theory um, talked about by Melzack and Wall in 1965. And the cool thing was, this, this was one of the ones that kind of started to bring in um, the kind of thing about the pain modulating system through a neural gate that's going to be in the spinal cord and how it opens and closes depending on um, how, what other things are going on and it can modulate how we perceive pain. Um, so the different things that can open the gate can be physical, like breaking your arm, some, some kind of injury or illness or something like that. can be emotional, like if you are, again, more stressed or more depressed or more anxious, that can open the gate more and increase your perception of pain. Or it can be behavioral, different, you know, uh, diet-based stuff, or even kind of if you have poor sleep, I mean, of course, it's going to kind of amp up anything else. So kind of noticing that. And then thinking about factors that can close it or help kind of reduce your perception of pain. Physically, you know, having different medications, pain medications to help you out there. Thinking about emotionally, you know, doing um, either relaxing things or kind of mood enhancing things. And then thinking about the behavior, kind of getting good sleep hygiene and getting a good diet to help um, manage the pain that way. To kind of take it a little bit um, further, we have just kind of a, as we also have better and better technology, better kind of understandings between the different physiological symptoms, psychological systems, and the neural networks that are going to be between to kind of think about how is this kind of all having interplay to affect our patients. And so it could be the autonomic and sleep-wake system, thinking about our hormones and the endocrine system, different sensory kind of things, or what are our models that we have that we learn from, what are our attentional capacities, obviously our emotions and cognitions, and how do they work together. Um, so this next one, we don't have to read everything or know everything, but it's just sometimes nice to kind of see um, how people are doing some research into chronic pain to understand better different psychological processes, and then breaking them down to different behavioral consequences, and then some of the brain areas that are involved. So thinking about... Um, if we have interoception, so that kind of sensory kind of feelings of your body on the inside, and how different areas are going to be involved with the anterior single course, uh, cortex, the anterior insula, and how that can affect chronic pain. Or we want to think about um, the reward system, including the different um, limbic system and the dorsal anterior single cortex or the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and how those things are being involved when it comes to pain and being kind of rewarded or not being able to be rewarded in certain activities. Um, and then even learning, so fear learning. So what's modeled? You know, maybe is it in the um, home? Is it in the environment? How is that going to be modeled and how does that... Um, affect the learning for patients. The caveat with a lot of this research is, though, that a lot of it is based on either animal models or adult models because, you know, surprise, surprise, it's probably pretty hard to get approval to work on the brains of children and other things. So um, that's going to be, you know, maybe further down the line, but just at least some places to start to start understanding better this kind of mystery that comes up with chronic pain. All right. And so again, just another way to kind of interesting, like think about the different topics when it comes to the brain and then what's the issue that's going on and how can we coordinate that with a certain treatment. So um, if we have, you know, issues in the hypothalamus or getting some information from there, doing, dealing with sleep, dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system and stress, maybe biofeedback, progressive muscle relaxation, sleep hygiene can help. Thinking about... Um, 
issues with the hippocampus and memory may, maybe some memory kind of stuff, depression and anxiety symptoms being reported, doing cognitive reappraisal or some more CBT based work, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, or issues with the re reward circuitry, not really, you know, having anhedonia, not really getting any pleasure from past, you know, kind of pleasurable things, and using behavioral activation to help treat it. So it's kind of just really neat to start to see some of these ways that, trying to, that we are trying to connect different brain functions and different brain areas to um, how to make them into more treatment-based stuff. I also like this kind of model when it comes to like more pediatric pain. So this is definitely um, nothing kind of confirmed. It's more of an exploratory model, but I like how that it's kind of trying to be really dynamic and interactive. And so we have different predisposing factors thing in here, different triggers that are going to be going on um, to kind of set things off. Then it's going to be what are some of the individual factors that are going on for this kiddo um, or teenager, you know, coping style, how do they deal with things, do they try to avoid, do they have like a negative attributional style that we might think of when we think of depression and just kind of already kind of um, looking negatively to the world. Um, then we also want to think about what are some other things that are going on around them. Um, at school, bullying or other stuff? Are there other family factors that are going on? Do their parents have um, chronic pain or other family members? Um, is this leading to them not doing as much either, either at home or at school? And then deconditioning in their muscles so they're not having as much activity to kind of guard themselves from any future pain? And then does this like usually lead to absenteeism from school and a lot of enmeshment between the parent and the child. Sometimes we say that our <laughs> patients need like a parentectomy um, or, uh, or momectomy or dadectomy um, to kind of help because again that's the natural thing though is that when what you are trained to do um, when it comes to pain or kind of medical symptoms go to the doctor you know get a test um, get a diagnosis and then you know get it treated and then you're better and rest you know take lots of fluids you know don't do anything too strenuous but that's what you've learned you know for maybe you guys 18 19 20 21 more years of your life that's what you we've been trained to do same thing with parents and so then when your child is telling you that you have pain automatically it's like going to the doctor doing tests trying to figure it out to solve the problem um, and that's what we've been trained to do, but chronic pain kind of flips things upside down. Because usually instead of one doctor, you're gonna have at least three, when you think about the medical doctor, psychologist, and the physical therapist. And then instead of having an actual diagnostic test, there is no, di there's no blood test or CT scan or x-ray to give you, like, be like, okay, today, Susie, your mind-body connection affects your pain by 12%, right? I wish I could be that easy to tell patients, but it isn't. And so that's really hard to kind of understand, but that's like some of the education we have to give uh, patients and families and to kind of reduce the, um, our typical reaction that we have when it comes to medical symptoms or in, especially when it comes to pain. Um, and so that can be a lot of the things that affect um, the pain and other stuff for our patients. And that's another thing of why there's a, all this high healthcare use and utilization, as they would call it. Um, and then thinking about other parent and family factors, I also like this as well um, because it helps us think about, you know, over here at the family level, what kind of, how's the family functioning going? Is it a kind of a good, healthy family with good communication? Is it more negative? Is it two parents, single family household, single parent household? Um, is it going to be um, older parents? That's another interesting thing, you know, how does that put it into context where maybe they were trying to have kids for a really long time and then this is their only child and suddenly there's a child with chronic pain. Of course it's going to make sense that every little thing is going to be attended to and taken care of because that's, you know, their one child and it's like such a kind of important kind of thing. So we have to kind of really think about where our patients and families are coming from and how can we support them but still kind of guide them into better treatment and better patterns, adaptive patterns. Um, then we want to think about parent level variables. So thinking about, you know, how do parents react? Um, what kind of emotional things are going on? What are their resources or coping skills? Because a lot of times one of the best predictors of child pain is parent catastrophizing. And so their anxiety level and their kind of way that they think and catastrophize how things are going oftentimes predicts how um, 
children are going to be reacting and even remembering their pain. Um, because it may come to one of those studies later on, but Dr. Melanie Knoll um, from Canada, I think University of Calgary, has done a lot of research in this kind of narrative nature and memory of pain for children and how children might report some levels of certain pain when they first or soon after their incident or uh, event or whatever it might be. And later on, you ask them three or six months later, their, if their parents have catastrophe, kind of report high catastrophizing, they're usually reporting that their memory of the pain now later is much higher than it was when they actually were experiencing it. So it's really interesting um, that people are trying to understand that was kind of parent level variables more. And then of course the different developmental more individual level variables for the patient. So thinking about how this kind of trifecta of, you know, what's going on behaviorally or physiology, behavioral and functional disability, emotional state, and the perception that children have, their developmental level as well. Because, again, especially when it comes to chronic illness, um, whether, whether it's pain or not, a lot of times we'll see regression in kids and teenagers. And so how do we support the family to help hold patients to kind of expectations that they're able to do? Not too extreme and not too simple, but enough to help them kind of keep on moving moving on and functioning, because that's our ultimate goal, is always to come back to functioning, whether it's school, chores, peers, to kind of help them that way. Um, so other kind of parent and family factors, thinking about some of this research, um, that's what I was talking to here, was kind of like that catastrophizing and attending to the pain for parents led to lower activity levels and lower functionality in uh, kids and teens. Um, for different emotional kind of issues, for being related to depressive symptoms and social functioning. Um, that's going to be something that is affecting patients when it comes to their management and what the child reports is how they are functioning. And then even some um, research on parent psychological flexibility. So it's a small study um, that showed early promise where if you can kind of decrease all that protective parenting and kind of rescuing that comes on um, when it came to pain, that was significantly related to decreased reports of pain by the, um, or pain interference into their functioning by adolescents. So now also wanting to bring in kind of some more cultural awareness and different things that we want to be mindful of when we're working with our patients and families is thinking about cultural competence. And so um, when we think about cultural p factors, you know, race, ethnicity, and culture are big variables, powerful variables that influence how people are thinking, making decisions, behaving, and defining uh, events. And so it's definitely going to affect therapy and how they view therapy. There's going to be different worldviews. Everyone has their own values and bias and assumptions about human behavior. So um, we also have to kind of put that all in the context that a lot of our schools of counseling and psychotherapy arise from Western European kind of context. So that's not, you know, universal. And so kind of keeping that in mind when it comes to different things that we're trying to uh, disseminate or kind of do and kind of being open-minded about that. Um, and it kind of helps us start to understand sometimes the hesitance institutionally or structurally or societally that can come from different uh, minority populations as well. Um, so definitely there's going to be a lot of multiple dimensions of cultural competence. And so one of them is looking at race and culture, um, kind of thinking about specific attributes of um, different race ethnicity groups. So dimension two, thinking about components of cultural competence, so awareness of attitudes and beliefs, knowledge and skills. And dimension three, different foci of cultural competence, societal, organizational, professional, individual, different levels. And so um, the tricky part is that a lot of times with cultural competence it's kind of been taken up by storm and run away with as if it's like something that we can all like achieve or it's something like that you like kind of check 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 and I'm good to go I'm culturally competent um, and it's not really that way <laughs> that kind of makes it almost um, uh, the opposite of what we want to kind of uh, think about of being dynamic and being open um, when it comes to thinking about uh, competency. And so culture is evolving and changing over time. And so our clinical work also should be approached with that awareness of diversity in our clients and thinking about our own biases and what are we bringing to the table um, while we are assessing the experiences throughout the process of therapy. And I really like instead um, this idea or kind of concept uh, uh, 
construct of cultural humility. And so that really, I think, helps to think about this lifelong commitment um, that's to self-evaluation and self-criticism, to redress different power imbalances that exist between, you know, psychologist and patient or patient-physician, and try to develop mutually beneficial and hopefully more non-paternalistic clinical and advocacy partnerships. Yeah. So then, kind of as we get more into now thinking about pain and the different um, kind of people that are going to be involved. So the nice part is that at Phoenix Children's, we're really lucky that we have a kind of a multidisciplinary team. And so it's going to be involving the medical doctors, like I was saying before, the psychologists. We also are going to have um, physical therapists, and then uh, especially throughout the system at, our, at the hospital, occupational therapists, nurses and nurse practitioners, huge people involved, um, child life specialists, and then different people, whether it's practitioners or elements of complementary and alternative medicine. And so how all of these things can become really helpful depending for different patients, need different, have different needs, but if we can all work together, it's usually what brings more um, effective kind of care and long-term success for these patients. Not one person or not one modality is going to kind of solve that problem. And so if we think about assessment, we want to do a nice, when it comes to pain, you know, um, we want to kind of get, get a good pain history of like what occurred, what was going on for the patient and family, because all those pieces, sometimes traumatic events, sometimes different illnesses, um, sometimes really bad accidents or issues, or even medical trauma, because, you know, re-hospitalizations, um, invalidating experiences in the emergency room can really create either... Um, more anxiety around doctor's appointments or meeting different doctors or just more mistrust and kind of being um, understanding and aware of that to help build rapport and being open to how to um, get a better, more accurate history. Um, so that's really helpful. Then kind of thinking about how do we assess pain in a developmentally appropriate way. So, you know, if there's a five-year-old, I'm not going to ask them to, you know, suddenly describe their pain or rate it on a maybe zero to ten scale with numbers or different things like that. You know, we might instead use what they call the visual analog scale and have different pictures of faces. And so kind of to point when you feel your pain, you know, which of these do you f feel, you know, does it re reflect or do you think you look like or that looks like you? And so kind of trying to make sure that you're using developmentally appropriate things or not giving a questionnaire to, again, like an eight-year-old if it's not appropriate for them. Um, then kind of being able to do that. Uh, and also making sure to give enough time over time um, to be able to reassess because the different kind of domains that can always be kind of fluctuating is that um, could be intensity, location of the pain, how long it lasts, the different sensory qualities of it that can give us clues to things like more burning kind of sensations or other things that might be related to more neuropathic nerve type pain than, you know, if I broke my arm, you know, having that more sharp kind of acute pain or dull or achy pain. Um, different cognitive and affective, so like kind of emotional aspects to it, um, contextual and situational factors as well, and also thinking about sleep nutrition like we talked about, and school and peers, so that's important. And also during our um, assessment time, we're going to also want to be thinking about, like we said, cultural related issues or other beliefs about symptoms, uh, and specifically about pain and pain management. So something, and then always being able to kind of try to reassess. Um, I won't go over all of these any kind of super in depth, but just to kind of keep in mind different, to kind of showcase there's a lot of different stuff that people are trying to do to um, take this chronic pain that seems to kind of, and pain itself very subjective, to try to get it more objective as we can. So looking at different biopotentials, so EMGs or electromyograms, kind of assessing how pain evokes changes in muscle tension. So how to try to capture some of those. EEGs, electroencephalography, so kind of getting those electrical signals um, and neuronal signals off the brain um, to be related to specific sensory stimuli. Um, changes in scalp voltage is what it's going to look at in different extracellular ionic channels. Um, thinking about stress hormones, so like cortisol and how that's going to be released, maybe depending on different experiences of pain. Um, because pain can really reach the brain and trigger the HPA, hypo, um, um, hypopituitary, uh, adrenal access, um, and thinking about how that is associated with pain, different um, 
inflammatory markers that more and more people are looking at because a lot of some, you know, even more anecdotally, kind of in our clinic, a lot of folks after different infections or um, big illnesses and viruses have a lot of pain that starts after that. And so could there be something that's going on with inflammatory markers, these cytokines that people talk about a lot um, in different ganglion and peripheral nerve cells? And thinking about different autonomic nervous system activity. So skin conductance, like kind of measuring um, those different changes due to the sympathetic nervous nerves in the skin, um, placing electrodes on hands and thinking, looking at receptors that release sweat from those different glands and even heart rate variability, so different things to kind of measure um, the, uh, how, it's pro how the peripheral pain in the body is processed more centrally um, through the heart and the vagus nerve. And so these are especially things that we would be seeing that we try to work on with different biofeedback um, treatments uh, and we'll kind of maybe hopefully be able to touch upon as we go on. So just the kind of interesting different research that people are looking at uh, in pediatric pain. Um, so then thinking about, we have assessment, how would we be treating these different things? And so the, before even getting into this part, we definitely have the three Ps we like to think about when it comes to the treatment. It's the physical, the pharma, like with physical therapy, pharmacological, with medications, and then of course, psychological. And so these are all really crucial um, when it comes to multidisciplinary treatment for chronic pain. But of course, I'll be focusing more on the psychological piece. Um, so we have a lot of different research that looks at distraction. And so, you know, kind of thinking about music or videos or um, just even conversation that can be helpful for when it comes to pain management. And then thinking about um, different behavioral pieces. So that's kind of the simple kind of basics that we want to start at with diaphragmatic breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, or different um, positive reinforcement kind of plans we can put in place to help um, reinforce more functioning behaviors and kind of decrease the reinforcement for more of the pain behaviors or avoidant type of behaviors. Because a lot of kids, even if it's thinking about avoiding school or avoiding different things at home or avoiding activity, how can we help uh, encourage that when it's not going to damage the patient and so they've gone you know we've gone through all the testing doctors and everyone's kind of given the okay to be doing stuff in a more gradual way we're not going to tell them to go run a marathon but how do we going to get them back into functioning and be do some behavioral based things on that um, and then definitely cognitive behavioral based programs thinking about how do we kind of identify um, our situation kind of the activating event, thinking about the different beliefs and behaviors that come up, thinking about negative automatic beliefs, thinking traps that you know, we all fall into, how do we identify those and how do we then kind of have cognitive restructuring or reframing to create more positive self-talk and how can we apply that to when it comes to pain management. Thinking about um, problem solving skills training, so that's just um, nothing like um, rocket science, but just like something that's been taken and done mostly in a oncology based, you know, parent format, but then now trying to redo it and be able to kind of get it, um, have more evidence based for when it comes to chronic pain. So those are some of the different things. And then having more mindfulness based and acceptance commitment therapy based approaches and how people are doing research to try to figure out um, how that can be applied to more chronic pain patients. Thinking about biofeedback, so kind of what I was talking about when we have that heart rate variability and skin conductance and how we can try to change that physiologically. Um, some people kind of think about that being um, not necessarily that we should not be controlling the physiology, but what are they, that it's more complex than just that training they suggest. But you know, there's different evidence going around. And then definitely another big area when it comes to pain management, whether it's headaches or just general chronic pain, is hypnosis, clinical hypnosis, um, which myself and my, uh, the other pain psychologists at Phoenix Children's have been trained in to help patients kind of do that. Um, and then also different complementary and uh, alternative medicine ways as well. So all these kind of strategies have different varying levels of research supporting them and we know that the kind of most evidence-based way that we start off with the multidisciplinary approach um, in, that incorporates psychology in these pieces as well as um, physical therapy and um, the appropriate medical piece. This is not meant to be all read, but just again, an interesting kind of work that people are looking at how um, we can look at oh, there, the physiological system that's being involved. 
um, and the psychological system, and then what could be a more targeted, perhaps, treatment for that, and then the different um, references that people are trying to start to do that are looking at that. So just kind of the cool things that people are trying to do um, when it comes to this research. And then again, we don't want to only think about the symptoms or the pathology, but also think about resilience when it comes to pediatric pain. And what kind of, just as to give a definition of resilience in this kind of format, is the demonstration of emotional, behavioral, or health outcomes that are going to match or surpass normative developmental milestones, behavioral functioning, or emotional well-being, despite being exposed to substantial challenges of living with and managing a medical or developmental condition. So a lot of times resilience and resilience outcomes, we want to, if we can, first focus on explicitly positive experiences. And then, if not just explicitly positive, but maintaining a typical trajectory. And then also resilience can include being able to have the absence of negative experiences as well like having low levels of distress or dysfunction. Though we like to kind of focus on more of the explicit positive things when we can. Things like, you know, reporting optimism, um, and of course how that higher levels of optimism being related to lower levels of pain ratings and different things like that. Self-efficacy and acceptance, kind of the same thing. Um, being able to notice if, you, if we can help build self-efficacy and if people who report higher levels of self-efficacy. So being able to manage things, and that self-efficacy can be in pain management, can be in emotion management, um, any kind of thing. Um, and acceptance can help be related to lower levels uh, of pain being reported if you have positive social functioning or being socially connected with peers instead of being withdrawn and isolated, even though that's a very common thing, how do we help support that? Um, and then definitely, um, especially in minority families, we've seen how different faith and extended family networks and role flexibility within the house or within the parent kind of structure is able to help with um, resilience and lower reports of pain. So now, moving on to the case. And so, for our case, it's going to be our 15-year-old um, Latina female of Mexican descent, and we'll just call her Mary. Um, and she was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. She is bilingual, uh, lives at home with her biological mom and her younger sister. Um, and so they're um, uh, there, and it's something that... Um, Again, kind of giving that context, it's mostly this inpatient consultation liaison type of case with an initial consultation and then a lot of subsequent visits that almost act as kind of outpatient um, treatment kind of things, but it's still not the same when you're in that pressure and acute environment of the hospital, but just an interesting context. But still kind of gets at a lot of the different um, issues we deal with when it comes to chronic pain, especially in the setting of a illness. Um, so thinking about, again, we're assessing the situation, assessing the pain and different things like that. We also want to think about her context. And so um, she's coming from a lower SES neighborhood. And thinking about that, there's you know, research of the risk factor that this has like, reports have a higher level of parent distress and different psychological maladjustment. And so that can mean also less um, uh, kind of resources, emotional resources to be providing patients or different people. And so kind of being aware of what we're asking and what's going on in that dynamic. And also uh, in the kind of um, neighborhood that she was reporting, also as a place where there's these extensive reports of exposure to community violence. But she was kind of denying any kind of that exposure um, significantly. And so it's like something that is one of those, again, parts of reassessment, whether it's pain or other contexts. We always want to longitudinally keep on reassessing and not just assume that we know um, what's going on. So then, again, we want to think about cultural factors. Again, not just being... Um, one-dimensional, we really want to be as three-dimensional as possible. And so for her, um, different this like kinship kind of, again, kind of out there as a resilience factor as well, having really extended family um, involved, so being able to provide support to mom and to patient and younger sibling for child care. So when mom was in the hospital, kind of following with patient and supporting her, there were people who were also to be involved and could take care of um, the younger sister, because sometimes other time when people are hospitalized, those younger siblings are also then at 
the hospital and they're losing their functioning by not being in school and then falling behind, in addition to the patient also falling behind, but because childcare is really expensive and other parents have to work to kind of keep insurance and other you know, payments and rent going. So it's a really tricky balance. And so how do we kind of do that? And so they were lucky um, that they had those high levels of social support. Also, um, they identified as Roman Catholic, so their spirituality was a different um, kind of cultural, but also um, uh, resilience kind of factor. Uh, another thing that was also helpful, I think, being from being born and raised in Miami and being bilingual, my, trilingual myself, and that being able to have been in the church before, having that kind of discussion and being able to bring that in this case appropriately to the table, um, knowing my patient and family context to kind of help kind of build rapport. Uh, because a lot of times when it came to those families who are Spanish speaking, um, having a bilingual provider has just been able to really bring down that guard and that barrier. Um, so that was a really cool thing to be able to provide for them. Um, and then also for Mary herself, her intelligence and social emotional maturity was mostly a strength and a kind of a resilience factor because she is able to live up to expectations for her parent, her mom, and her medical team. But that also meant that she knew when people were talking, what the doctors were saying, she was like Googling things online and kind of like getting real anxious about stuff um, and able to understand like, hmm, this is not wrong or this is not being explained or people are unsure about that. So it kind of was also something to consider about when it came to her own kind of emotional functioning. And so just even thinking about the types of pain that she was reporting. Again, if we think about um, that assessment, that we want to get a good kind of pain assessment. Um, nociceptive, just meaning that it's like actually like actual pain experiences and tissue damage, like that's going to be going on, those kind of receptors in the um, nervous system. Thinking about um, neuropathic pain, that's more of that nerve pain on the ends of nerve fibers that doesn't respond the same way to things like Tylenol and ibuprofen as it normally would. Or even sometimes um, what we see you know, in when it comes to chronic illness in the hospital, different opioid medications, whether it's you know, morphine or Dilaudid or Oxycontin or um, Oxycodone or Toradol or you know, all these different things, um, they don't always respond the same way when it's more of a neuropathic pain or a chronic pain. So mucositis, just like kind of the mucosa of the mouth and um, kind of face getting more kind of inflamed and being hard to eat and swallow. Um, different back pain, abdominal pain, because again, when you're in the hospital and you have something like cancer, you're going to get these opioid medications, but then also that causes constipation. And then that's going to cause possibly an abdominal pain. Um, and then for her also, in her youth, you know, being um, not having her period and then, then or kind of a, a regular period and not causing um, more kind of amplification of the chronic pain. Um, and then different kind of... Um, there we go. Um, different kind of typical uh, inflammation and inflammatory infections or illnesses that come with cancer. Um, and then also different chemo-induced nausea. So then she's having that abdominal pain, having nausea, not really eating, but then not getting nutrients to kind of heal, and then that causing more sensitivity to pain, and then also having all this kind of stuff making her sleep get off schedule, so then she's not sleeping well. And it kind of just kind of creates a um, really vicious cycle that way. Another thing that we see that's not really here, but something that we consider when it comes to chronic pain is that we'll have different categories thinking about hyperalgesia. And so that's like when typically painful things are just more painful than usual for that patient. And then even another interesting concept, allodynia, which is where typically non-harmful or painful things end up being painful. So just like even light touch. Um, so different videos, um, interesting YouTube videos that you can kind of check out is Elliot Crane, um, a TED Talk by him or a TED Talk by um, uh, Larmer Mosley, who are different pain researchers that um, talk about how even like a feather can feel like a torch um, to patients who have sometimes this kind of complex regional pain syndrome or allodynia. So different other interesting things um, to be thinkful, thinking about and mindful of. Um, and then again, thinking about the assessment, trying to assess this pain for Mary um, and understand um, even at the beginning, what was her baseline? Is she like this? Um, because, you know, we have these uh, coming to chronic pain clinic athletes, these like, you know, very competitive gymnasts or swimmers or volleyball players or soccer players who now with their 
chronic pain or issue, their identity has really changed a lot because they've lost that ability to be a part of, um, well, whether it's the team or being a part of as that achievement that they used to have. For Mary, it wasn't as much of a difference because she was more of uh, staying at home, doing schoolwork and kind of thing, but still not being able to be as in touch with her friends, um, not being able to hang out as much, not only from her um, chemo and those kind of things and infectious or, you know, immunocompromisation, but also even if she were feeling a little better, not really wanting to be out and about. And so that can be really changing her um, mood and like how things are going for her. Um, but so that's how we want to think about when we get our baseline and trying to understand the difference between um, the acute or chronic pain that we were kind of making that list right before and thinking about um, uh, exacerbating factors that make the pain worse or alleviating factors or relieving factors that make it better. Um, for her, um, as kind of maybe any kind of teenager, she kind of was like, mm, I don't know, it's random. And so she had a hard time kind of maybe pinpointing that kind of stuff. Um, so that was a little trickier. Um, and then the other thing was also um, a lot of hospitalizations for pain control versus being able to come in for what we would have expected for her planned chemotherapy. Um, so this kind of just underscores, she had about like five or six admissions that was just for pain management in the span of five months. And so it A, shows how difficult it can be treat, to treat chronic pain, and then it really, again, underscores that level of cost that comes with this high healthcare utilization. Um, and it is like being really, you know, have a lot of nuances because we would expect someone having active treatment of cancer to be in pain, but how are all these things kind of influencing one another? How do we parse it apart and differentiate? And so another p uh, factor in this puzzle is that after these multiple hospitalizations um, where she didn't have other acute reasons for coming in for the pain, um, and being a training hospital, so you have, you know, your attendings and those physicians and psychologists, but also different medical residents, medical students, and different things like that who rotate. Um, they, uh, certain members of the medical team, maybe didn't know the patient's whole story. So they were beginning to express um, concern about, is the patient drug seeking or doing other kind of things like that? And so whether or not they exactly conveyed that directly to Mary or her family, a lot of times that kind of language or that kind of even vibe can be experienced and kind of felt. So we really have to be careful um, not to invalidate patients. Again, we don't excuse things or we don't kind of just um, let things go as if we're not trying to get better or make changes, but we want to be really kind of meet people where they're at and validate them and find ways to help kind of things, bring different resources and things together multidisciplinary wise to help them out more. Um, so that kind of unconscious message, unconscious message was sent and was something that I had to kind of deal with kind of against to kind of build rapport. Um, so then we kind of, we have that assessment and we want to think about treatment and therapy. And so of course those three Ps, so the pharmacological, different analgesics, so whether that's, um, you know, kind of some of the typical Tylenol or other stuff, but then also oxycodone and Norco and Dilaudid, both through their IV and oral. Um, Physical therapy, so that was a little more limited um, for the patient, sometimes because of her infectious kind of uh, disease issues, if she was like more immunocompromised, and sometimes that, that just was not really something that was as available for people who have things like cancer versus someone who's like, recovering from a surgery. Um, and then more though, for on my end, is the psychological part. And so this was even just kind of taking it slow. Um, and so that's where I was just even kind of starting off when I wanted to build rapport, give her a chance to kind of feel like she was being heard and not just kind of boom, 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 what's your pain, what's going on? And so how can we even listen? And so, for example, her thing was a child life specialist would come in, different people would come in to offer a volunteer, like a different activity, and she would feel so bad she didn't want to say no. But she was like feeling either just not up for it or whatever, and so she didn't feel like she was being heard. So even just giving her like a little sheet that said like healing in progress to like put on her door so people could like give her some space as a teenager and like give her a chance where she didn't have to say no and disappoint people because that was not what she wanted but she still was able to get her space and be able to rest or kind of recover that way. Um, then kind of even thinking about um, destigmatizing this kind of mind-body connection because we want to make sure that we're not saying that 
your you know psychological kind of concerns or symptoms are causing the pain we have to fight back against I have to fight back against that all the time every day basically but thinking about how does the mind body connection affect the pain so an example I usually give is that if I have to go in front of a group of 100 500 people and I have to give a speech or dance or sing or different things how might I feel I might feel nervous, right? So my face gets red, my mouth gets dry, I start sweating everywhere, my heart beats really fast, and I get that <sighs> hyperventilation and get those butterflies in my stomach. And then, so what I say, you know, did I do those things on purpose? No, right? It just happened. Um, and so, I mean, I wish I could, like, have a little switch to turn off my sweat glands so I don't look like a sweaty lobster in front of 500 people. But I can only do, help myself out by using my coping skills that I've learned. Um, or if I avoid this situation, but I can't avoid everything. So the same thing is true when it comes to pain. The pain is real and it's there, but how do we kind of work on that mind-body connection to turn down the stress and anxiety so, and boost up mood to turn down the volume of pain in the body? Or vice versa, how do we help the body feel a little more relaxed so it can turn down the volume of pain in the brain? So that's a way we kind of try to bring in that mind-body connection and get that buy-in from patient and family. Um, and then, of course, for her, for Mary, distraction was a good thing, for, especially for smaller kind of procedures, IV placements or blood draws or stuff like that. So, you know, having her music, iPad videos, or even conversations. And so that was related to less pain and distress. Um, we were also able, because of the multiple visits, you know, able to kind of do some... Uh, combine cognitive and different cognitive behavioral strategies and behavioral strategies. So like that diaphragmatic breathing and relaxation, progressive muscle relaxation, tightening and loosening those muscle groups, um, different guided imagery, um, or, you know, uh, for her, she wasn't into like the kind of thinking about it as a hypnosis thing, but more of this kind of more guided thing um, and different kind of positive um, mental images and positive self-talk that we were trying to relate for her. And then lastly, that complementary and alternative medicine was something that, again, if I think about their cultural context, and we had discussed it before, they were more open to maybe different kind of alternative medicine things. So she was more comfortable when I was talking about bringing in aromatherapy or getting acupuncture or massage involved. And, you know, how we were able to kind of combine that aromatherapy with the guided imagery to work on the brain's learning systems of how to connect and pair relaxation with these different kind of sensory experiences. So kind of being able to do that. Um, so what I would have loved to also do is work more on is like kind of think about um, managing that parent assumptions and misconceptions and kind of try to help, was attempting to help mom work on her psychological flexibility. The tricky part was where she would try to always be attending to the pain to try to diminish it. So, you know, are you feeling pain now? Oh, let's get you a medicine or let's, um, you know, get rid of, you know, do this or do that or turn off the lights or something like that. And so that ends up bringing attention to it and kind of usually exacerbating the chronic, especially when it comes to chronic pain or even acute pain. But then also when it was coming to... Um, her emotional pain, whenever we would be discussing things, whether it was losing friends or having other difficulties or falling behind in school when she was such a good student and becoming tearful, mom was kind of like, okay, thank you very much. You can kind of go now. And so it was like, you know, you kind of kind of can only do so much as much as where your parents and families are at or patients and families are at. And so I couldn't like, I can say like, I think this would be really helpful, but in the end, got to listen to what the consent is based on that patient and family. So, and you got to build rapport. So I would like go. And so that didn't really offer that opportunity to kind of build on, can I get that self-efficacy? So I'm like, can I emotion, can I regulate my emotions in a, you know, adaptive way so then I can handle also when the pain comes around? So we, were, we weren't really able to get there. Even though I think, again, for her intelligence and ability, she would have been really able to get that. Um, and then I offered outpatient therapy, but again, this is another common thing that we come across. You know, if you have to kind of drive to the hospital multiple either times a week to go to your infusion center or if you have a lot of hospitalizations, the last thing you want to do is come to the hospital again for your psychology appointment. Um, and so we try to, you know, do it as much as we can in a combined way, but it was really hard for them to think about getting, you know, child care maybe for sister or taking off of work when this was the few little times um, to be able to make money for mom. 
So instead of, you know, coming at it in a biased way where, oh, you should be listening to what the doctors say or what the psychologist's recommendation is, like do not patient therapy, you have to acknowledge that there's a lot of barriers that are in there for our different patients and families. So how can we try our best to work around it if and when possible? Um, so that was just a limiting factor that um, was going on because I really think that she could have benefited from that. Um, thinking about outcomes. And so we did get some relief from our different strategies for Mary's pain. Um, the other thing that you know you can't underestimate is that um, there was a, a little bit more increased acceptance of psychology at least. So you know where you know instead of times people might have these negative stigmas and associations that you have to be crazy to talk to the psychologist or different things like that. This way hopefully you know it was just kind of part of the medical team and we were working on different stuff. We weren't just sitting there talking about our feelings. We were also doing other behavioral and other kind of strategies that were kind of changing the physiology and changing stuff in the body too. Um, so that hopefully was helpful and can maybe set the stage because sometimes that's our you know you know coup or that's our win is that we had a good enough experience with us as a psychologist or therapist so that when they are ready to see someone or talk about something or handle something then they'll be more open to it because they had a good experience with us so that's something else and um we ended up kind of referring her to a more multidisciplinary day treatment program when she kind of finished more of the active um intense treatment for um, chemotherapy, being able to go to, which we didn't, we don't have at Phoenix Children's either or other hospital, um, where they can get, you know, PT, OT, school, um, and psychology, individual and group therapy on more of like a daily basis and then go home at night and then kind of have that for a few weeks or so to kind of attack the pain. Not in, well, not while you, you don't have to be pay much to be the hospital, but you can do this on an outpatient kind of basis. Um, what I would have liked to, done, uh, to have done is try to use more um, of those kind of uh, act and mindfulness based skills and approaches to have more time to do that because I think Mary's intelligence um, would have been able to kind of be a, uh, get it because we, you know, obviously are not likely to say that we can completely remove um, the cancer or all of the pain, but how can we have thought about helping Mary to be as functional as possible? Um, and then maybe another thing could have been if we had the time to work more on like a problem-solving skills training approach, because sometimes if we can, again, with that mom who was a little more hesitant, if we bring it down and just work on maybe more targeted problem-solving on a certain issue, and we get like, again, positive reinforcement, like we work together and we were able to solve a, even a small problem. Oh, this thing is working. This therapy is working. Okay, let's keep on doing it. Or now we put our attention somewhere else. Or now we maybe are able to um, be talking more about those emotions instead of trying to kind of reject them or like, uh, suppress them. Um, possibly motivational interviewing to kind of get at different things that might be holding uh, Mary back. It would have been cool if she could have been participating in group therapy because I think, again, as a very intelligent, insightful young lady. She would have been able to kind of be contributing and gaining from that group therapy. Um, and then, again, those kind of outpatient therapy to process some more of the family dynamics that were going on um, that we weren't really able to do in the hospital. And so all those things could have been hopefully other ways to have expanded and even doing more things with um, clinical hypnosis and different things like that as a, a availability. Thinking about, you know, my focus wouldn't have been on her sister per se, but that's another person in the family kind of system. What's going on for her? Do we need to get her resources? Also, thinking about for mom, another common thing is reminding parents to do some more self-care because in order to parent your child the best, you have to make sure that you're kind of in the best place as well. So how do we balance that out? So all those different things to kind of consider.